Our next speaker is Artyom Malgin. Alongside with Lisa Volek, those are two people who will take it from us, old people, into their hands and carry Russia to victories and, 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 and Brighton Heights. So he represents, he's a first vice rector of one of the best universities uh, in Moscow, which is Mgimo, and uh, a good friend of, of World Policy Conference. Please, Artyom. Just two remarks to the first. Uh, what I uh, wrote, the title of the session sounds really very sad because uh, neither me nor my colleagues will be at, let's say, at the climax of their life uh, activities and professional activities in 20 years. I will so try. I will try. So with uh, with all this uh, look, intellectual, all artificial... We'll, we we'll all <laughs> do our best. But, but, and that is why we could be a little bit irresponsible. Second, when Thierry was um, uh, in, uh, in Moscow in, uh, in March this year, uh, he, I mean Thierry de Manbrial, he invented this subject and especially reserved it for the politicians because one of the of two Russian politicians, they promised him to come if he puts the subject as it is. So they promised to him to tell truth, but the truth which will happen in 20 years, because they uh, said that they want to be really very uh, brave, but they don't want to cover uh, contemporary developments in Russia. Finally, they are not here. I mean, these two brave gentlemen, and uh, that is why we uh, can talk uh, more truth on even contemporary things than they planned to do. Uh, I'll follow m much uh, Michel Fouché uh, example because uh, even some thoughts, um, they are much in parallels, uh, they uh, resemble, and I guess it shows that analysis of uh, foreign policy, first of all, because I consider myself much more special on foreign policy than on other issues. Uh, foreign policy analysis is much like in France and uh, Russia. First of all, uh, on uh, the say, um, guidelines and trends how I see uh, which will result in, uh, in 20 years. So first, Russia in 20 years, I guess, will be m much more self-centered, self-concerned, with policy and ambitions made by measure, because we still feel ourselves bigger and stronger than we are. And uh, that is why we're going to be, let us say, less interventionist in 20 years, I uh, hope, because we uh, will realize our scale in global affairs and our uh, resources, because many of the problems which we face now, they're because of overestimation uh, or just simply uh, wrong uh, estimation, wrong appraisal of who we are. Second, I guess Russia will be more open, at least towards its neighbors, uh, since by that time we will manage to build uh, this Russia-centered integration, which brings together our Eurasian neighbors, as well as uh, will manage to find modus operandi with EU and EU-led uh, countries. And to have, as a, let's say, immediate geographic resource, these two parts of uh, Eurasian continent, here yeah, I don't mean Eurasia politically, that's uh, which all very often somehow limited by, by uh, former borders of the USSR, it uh, automatically makes Russia more pro-open. Uh, then, so I guess Russia will be more participative, more multinationalism devoted, and much more assertive. Limits of extensive growth by that time, they will be clear, already achieved. Yeah? Oh, simply clear. Yeah? Uh, so Russian presence will be, let's say, probably better seated all, all over the world, but it won't be, let's say, this political presence, the state-run uh, presence all over the world. It's rather Russian companies, Russian investments, Russian-led but multilateral initiatives 
which will be better presented in other parts of the world. And I guess uh, thanks to that, we will find more Russian presence in Africa, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Central, Central and Eastern Europe, which are our immediate neighbors and natural neighbors to the great system. Then, uh, fourth, I guess Russia by that time, and no one, uh, I guess everyone agrees uh, with that, uh, it's more developed, probably slightly, here I should stress this was slightly less resource dependent, and clearly more digital. Russia will be on a steady track, steady path towards an old European state standard. Here I completely agree with Michel Fouché that it's to the greatest extent will be kind of France-like country, rather big, with relatively big, but not enough to fill the territory properly population, with strong cultural, but not in terms, that they say, of this Beaux-Arts culture, influence around the neighbors. Here, uh, this diaspora helps us ensure the Russian language itself. It, once again, it's comparison with nowadays France. It's about 300 million people, those who have good command of French language and those have good command of Russian language. So the model is clear where we move to. Dao in country population is going sure to be bigger than in France. Also another comparison, sometimes uh, comparison helps. It's, it's a Turkey, it's Turkey. But let us say not nowadays Turkey, but Turkish, Turkish model, Turkish size, Turkish trends as they were 10, 15 years ago. Because now there are too many uncertainties in nowadays Turkey, and it's not yet clear how it will develop the trends which are present in nowadays Turkey. It's the first portion. The second portion, uh, I want to stay, say that trends which I've already enlisted, they are they already set or down probably not of them uh, clear, but they will be shown to the public. They will be end of evident by, uh, to the uh, public in the year 2018. And I guess uh, Russian presidential elections of the year 2018 will somehow stress many of these trends. They make them evident and uh, most of them, they will result in a specific steps, in a specific policies, in a, uh, specific actions after the presidential elections. The result for these elections is clear, I mean, when it comes to personality. Putin will stay in power since he has no competitors, because all those who want to start in the elections, they're not as strong, not as smart, not, not as experienced, and it's, it's clear who will win elections. But uh, President Putin already proved many times that he's one of the, let us say, most, how to say, it's, uh, it's not about uh, secrecy, unsurprising surprising uh, representative of the nowadays elite who uh, has a very strong quality to change, to start a new policy, to simply be a new man. Do compare his first storm, the years 2000, 2005. It's the best period, the most EU propelled Russian foreign policy. What we achieved by the year 2005, in, if we compare it with nowadays situation, it looks like it was completely another country. It looks like it was completely another president, but still it's the same man. And uh, now I 
very pessimistic about some policies, some steps. I it sounds probably uh, a, a, a little bit patriotic, but I believe <laughs> in this president, and I believe in many changes. And these changes they already started. First of all, it's a uh, strong reshuffle in uh, public administration when it comes to the Russian regions. More than a dozen of governors, they were removed from their posts and newcomers appeared. Some of the newcomers completely unknown to the general public, both in Russia and surely abroad. Uh, changes in the cabinet that will proceed after the elections because elections will give an, a simply a pretext to make these changes because in Russia we always need a pretext uh, why we need to do this or uh, that. Then uh, last three years and it's not because of sanctions it's because of this uh, objective in total developments new branches new uh, uh, industrial policy I guess already uh, proved its results. Uh, I, here I always compare with Central and Eastern Europe because we started from the same point where have nearly the same GDP when it comes uh, per capita uh, uh, GDP. We're nearly uh, the same when it comes to mentality, but look at the economic discussion, social discussion in Poland, Hungary, Czech, Slovak Republic. The discussion somehow surrounded about very minor things of the 1990s. Yep. Here, I guess, uh, Russia goes much ahead. And uh, now it's propelled by the idea, probably simply blown up idea, but still it propels a digital economy. And I guess this artificially invented thing moves uh, Russian economy and the, coal and the whole Russian economic regulation mechanism towards something something new. And also I uh, hear uh, highly estimate Russian financial market, Russian financial policy of the central bank, which already somehow have overca uh, overcomes standards of central and eastern uh, Europe. And here the size means the effects of these changes, they multiplied faster, they multiplied on a bigger scale, and I guess it, these technical changes will bring democracy. And here I nearly quote uh, the first uh, pre Vice Prime Minister Shuvalov, whom we mentioned yesterday in, in, in our private uh, talk, who stressed it twice once uh, it was in the Far Eastern Economic Forum, and a few days ago uh, he repeated it again. Because uh, democracy in Russia, I guess, is very much linked with economics reforms, and economics reforms they go first, and only then goes this uh, traditional uh, uh, portion of democracy. Then, what is also sometimes not so much remarkable from outside, it's interrelated divergences, and I can call it even a kind of. Uh, growing pluralism within Russian elite. When you observe the country from outside, you can say that uh, it has really very uh, weak opposition, unstructured, with no chances. But the real political life, real political discussion happens within those who are considered as a ruling elite. Sometimes the divergence is there, and the divergence is it's a source of change much stronger than between ruling elite and those who pretend to be in a position. And when they stand inside country, uh, who is who? Who belongs to what grouping? Whom you should talk? Whom you should not talk if you belong to this or that grouping? And it's evident nearly to everyone who is probably not even at the top, but somehow approaches towards this knowledge. And the uh, uh, third uh, portion of what I want to say, it's uh, simply form policy key points uh, and changes, how I see them, uh, which would, could happen under the uh, next term of the president, uh, put in or at least at the first part of uh, this term. 
First of all, uh, yes, we need and it will happen normalization of our relations with EU. Uh, there will be slight reshuffle when it comes uh, to hierarchy of bilateral relations. France go first, goes first. I guess we could await of the return of Britain after Brexit because they, I mean British, they simply need additional room of maneuvering and simply activating Russia's policy. They will have this additional uh, room of maneuvering and in many other trades, uh, even under this sanctions period, they show that the Brits, they look more and more carefully at what's happening in Moscow. I guess we'll have less of Germany. Uh, finally, stronger role for uh, Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans. Because now there is no more emotions when it comes to the Russia's policy uh, towards Balkans. I guess we should get rid of what uh, we previously had to have ours and not ours in the Balkans. Yesterday session, the first one uh, with two prime ministers of Serbia and Albania, I guess should be shown on the Russian TV to the general public just to stop saying that Albanians and Serbs, they somehow uh, destined to kill each other. The reality shows that they start talking and those who still continue thinking that uh, all these divisions somehow could be used in the Russian foreign policy for the best of the Russian foreign policy, I guess it's, it's a strongest mistake. The life showed to us that last 27 years, uh, we somehow tried to find out divergences and to play upon these divergences, I mean, all over the world. But permanently we failed to use these intra-imperialist worlds, how it was called under the Soviets. As well as under the Soviets, I guess we always also somehow uh, <coughs> Very, had too many ambitions about uh, this and too poor results uh, as uh, they ended, I mean, the ambitions. Then, I guess we'll find how to deal with uh, integration challenges that derive from EU and how to reapproach both of the integration, Russian-led and EU-led integration. The Ukrainian crisis at the very beginning, I mean, uh, oh, uh, this climax phase of the, uh, phase of, uh, the crisis, I mean, the year 2014, showed a very remarkable thing, uh, or very outstanding thing, which is, was not so much remarkable. Probably you remember that we started finally these consultations between EU and the Russian Ministry of Economic Development, as well as uh, the subsequent uh, uh, bodies in Ukraine, how to put together uh, Ukraine special relations in terms of economy with Russia, uh, in terms of economy and trade, because at that time all uh, these ties still existed, and how uh, to add to this their, uh, uh, their thrust and their, uh, their policy, which uh, somehow moved them towards European Union. These uh, consultations and in nothing, but the fact that they started, that they waged, it's, it, it's a really very promising thing, which should be repeated in a, in a, in a new situation. Then it's, uh, and I will finish, uh, so. uh, I guess uh, we will f uh, face strong and faster development in uh, Russian-led integration, thanks to uh, the smooth relations with the EU, I hope with Ukraine, thanks to eventual changes in Belarus, and thanks to a newcomer to the Russian-led integration, Uzbekistan. The country which opens the country tremendously rich, both in natural resources and what you said, 
in intellectual resources. It's out of comparison with other Central Asian Republic. Uzbekistan under the Soviets was always intellectual leader, leader of the region. Somehow it was overshadowed by Kazakhstan growth, by uh, Kazakhstan ambitions uh, under the dissolution of the Soviet Union. But those who know well Uzbekistan, they understand that it's outstanding resource of initiatives, outstanding resource of uh, modernity uh, and, new, uh, and new positive challenges. And uh, two last points. I, uh, absolutely uh, key point for the next storm is appeasement with Ukraine, normalization of relations. Crimea will stay as it stays now. It should be said clear, no one uh, will make any specific, specific moves there. But Crimea should be open towards Ukraine. Three years proved that 50 years of the Soviet time somehow linked Crimea to Ukraine at least as uh, tight as it was linked with uh, Russia and Crimea could uh, be a starting point for better relations because of its uh, transport uh, dependence on Ukraine, economic dependence, social dependence, and, 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 uh, but sure the Don, uh, conflict in Donbass uh, should be uh, unconditionally stopped and uh, these territories uh, they have no way but to stay within uh, Ukraine. Uh, I wanted to say about uh, states, but I don't want to dominate the discussion. The role of the states will go down simply because we don't need so much each other in everyday life. Then uh, those who want to ask me why, I will explain.